any device that connects to this wonderful thing called the internet, please either scan this QR code or just go to, ooh, it's trying to upgrade iOS. Let's not do that. All right. So yes, please scan this QR code or go to this website called slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com. And enter without a pound sign uh, 01110, which is today's date uh, prefix with a zero. So either through QR code or slido.com and enter the numbers. And people uh, can just ask me anything. This is literally ask me anything uh, on this interactive chat room. And the way it works is that um, if you are in the chat room, you can ask me anything anonymously, or if you prefer with the pseudonym of your real name. And if you see a question that other people has asked that you also want to ask, you can press like. And a question with the most number of likes will appear on the top of the projected screen here. And the newest question will appear on the bottom so that we can have a real flow of conversation. And uh, because we don't have microphone here, so feel free to just at any time raise your hand or without raising your hand, just start to speak. And then we'll can, we can have a um, you know, audio channel conversation as well. And so I'm very glad to see there's already um, people here starting asking questions. And so I'll demonstrate how it's going to be handled. Um, so you can like that question. And as you like it more, it will float on top relative to other uh, questions. And this question in particular is asking, what is the message on my t-shirt name? Um, so can I ask a raise of hands? Have you heard of the Sustainable Development Goals, or the SDGs? I think it's OK, more than half people. And, and so the 17 Sustainable Development Goals uh, is what those colors mean. And it means um, that the United Nations around the year 2015, after consulting with more than 1 million people on this planet, maybe on other planets, I'm not sure, but at least on this planet, uh, asking what are your preferred future for our common future for this planet uh, in the year 2030. And they get more than one million voices. And after they collected those more than one million voices, they ended up sorting it into 169 uh, concrete targets that every nation, developed or developing, agreed to get there by the year 2030. So that's called the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, or Global Goals. And so um, the message here says Taiwan for health, meaning that um, in Taiwan, we have figured out particular interesting ways to meet the Sustainable Development Goals together. And I'm happy, uh, as always, to share these methodologies with people around the world. And so that will be the topic, actually, of my talk. And as I you know, go on with my talk, feel free to just start asking random questions. It doesn't have to uh, be of any relevance to open government or sustainable human <laughs> growth or social innovation. Literally, ask me anything. Um, and so there's two people now asking what does Taiwan's digital ministry do? That's an excellent question. So I joined the cabinet two years ago uh, as the digital minister. And the digital minister, um, I have a compact, uh, not a contract, with the government. It was literally crowdsourced. Um, when I joined um, in October 2016, it's after one month of consultation. Now it's not quite UN SDG. I didn't have one million people. It's more like 2,000 people or so. Uh, crowdsourcing what they expect the digital ministry to do. And at the end, we ended on three uh, core principles. Uh, it's called um, radical transparency, everything I can see, I chair, I publish on the internet. People really want to know how is it like to be a digital minister. And so I publish to the internet every meeting that I chair, every lecture that I give, every lobbying. Um, you know, the lobbyists go meet me, and then I publish the whole transcript, and every media interview as well. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And radical transparency is plus one. That's like when it's voluntary association. I give no orders. I take no orders. This is purely coordinated, facilitated ministry. And the third thing is location independence. So without further ado, I'm going to show you my office. So this is my office. <laughs> <laughs> it's located in central Taipei, uh, just near the Tingbo Flower Market. The Dai Central Park is our central park in Taipei. And this is called the Social Innovation Lab, or SIL. The Social Innovation Lab is 
also crowdsourcing, you may see a pattern here. After a month of uh, crowdsourcing, more than 100 social entrepreneurs and social innovators co-created this space. For example, the soccer field that you see here has grown by people with Down syndrome. It turns out that they have a very geometric view on the world that enabled them to see the world with a different lens, a lens than I do. And it's very visually appealing, and they share with that particular vocabulary their unique contribution to this space. And the space, again, because it's crowdsourced, people ask for lots of things. They ask that this space have a resident chef, um, and uh, it opens until um, 11 p.m. Every, every day, including on the weekends, and we share a lot of food, a lot of event activity. As long as your activity relates to one of the sustainable development goals, you can use this venue for free. And also, they ask the digital minister to be here every week. So every Wednesday, if I'm not traveling abroad, I'm literally, this is my office hour, every Wednesday I'm here from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. and anyone can come and talk to me. So social workers, rough sleepers, people working on universal basic income, people working on building an embassy for the extraterrestrial beings. Uh, we have a lot of very interesting people with very interesting thoughts, and as long as they agree of radical transparency, that's to say publish the entire dialogue online, um, I welcome everybody to the Social Innovation Lab. And that includes non-human beings. For example, these beings uh, are self-driving tricycles. Um, they call themselves persuasive electric vehicles, or PEVs. They came out of Boston, out of MIT Media Lab. And that is because one of the creators of these PEVs visited me and saying, you know, we really want a place to, for people to tink up with our PEVs. And I'm like, sure, just come, just come to this place. So this place is literally a living lab. Every week, the features may change based on people's contributions. And so these PEVs are one of the contributions. Now, um, people here, of course, have heard of self-driving vehicles. I mean, these are not exactly news now. We, we see uh, people doing trucks, doing drone delivery, autonomous ships, things like that that are kind of commonplace. But on the other hand, um, not many people actually have interacted first hunt with a self-driving vehicle. And so in Taipei, when we introduced these self-driving vehicles, we did it in a way that's intentionally uh, harmless. These are pretty slow. It, they don't harm anyone if they run into buildings or something. And it solves a concrete social issue because we're close to the Tianguo flower market and there's a lot of like elderly people who just came to the flower market, buy some pots of orchids and things like that, and it gets really heavy and so before they finish strolling the market, they have to get home, they get tired and things like that. And so these companion animals, quote unquote, just accompany those people strolling around the Jingle flower market. And so you can just put pots of flowers on it as you just continue on the flower market. And by the end of it, you can hop out and you can drive to your home and things like that. So basically, we co-domesticate with these non-sentient uh, but moving beings and in a way that is what we call open innovation, meaning that the source code, the hardware schema, um, the data that you collect is all open so that if you want to change, for example, the red light here that signifies it doesn't know what to do uh, into a, a rainbow color or emoji or a cafe or whatever, you're free to do so. And so this brings personal back to personal computing and this brings the, the norm, uh, the social norm of interacting with these self-driving beings into the hands of the society. So this is kind of what the digital ministry does. It's basically showing everybody the possibility of digital technologies, not through a lens of technology, but through a lens of co-creation. And we do so because previously, uh, in the battle days, in the last century, people kind of think the government is kind of this rogue. And with, for example, the economy minister as one of the most that organize people around business, and another ministry, maybe the environmental ministry, has another minister that organizes people that cares about the environment, for example. And the rope in between, this is the civil service, the people in the civil service that are larger than anonymous, that absorb all the tension, that try to arbitrate something that is fair. And so this is the classical public administration model, which is completely broken nowadays, by the way, because we have the social web, we have hashtags, the important social innovation. So people don't need counselors or ministers to organize yourself anymore with the right hashtag. 
tens of thousands of people just organized out of nowhere uh, and to, to enable social change. And so first, the old organizational duty of the government is dwindling. And the second thing is that we cannot have one council or one ministry for each emergent issue, for distributed ledgers, for AI machine learning, for self-driving vehicles, and so on. It doesn't work like that way anymore. And so we're switching into a different governance model. And this is what I learned. It's the first political system that I learned when I was 15 years old. Um, that was 1996. Uh, and it was uh, in the second year in junior high, just second year in junior high, and I said to my teachers and the principal saying, you know, I just found this new thing called the Wide Web, where the researchers are just publishing their preprints for peer review uh, of everybody. And I just sent them an email and they start co-creating knowledge with me and they don't know I'm just 14 years old or something. <laughs> uh, and so uh, I don't have to go to a top university or finish my class or whatever, right? Uh, I just go down to this world web thing and we can do research together. And so I want to quit high school, I said to my teachers, and start creating knowledge that will be in the textbook 10 years afterwards instead of reading up on the cutting edge technologies and knowledge uh, that was created 10 years in the past. And surprisingly, all my teachers agreed with me. And so they basically faked my attendance records and then just <laughs> went off and started some social enterprises uh, back in 1996. Uh, that's during the dot com boom. So um, it, it makes me an optimist in the flexibility of bureaucracy. If you have a really good reason, uh, then you can convince the bureaucracy to kind of enter your will. And so uh, when, when I dropped out of junior high, I enter into this community that's still around today. It's called the Internet Society. The Internet Society basically governs the internet, uh, but we don't call them uh, rule makers, we're not lawmakers, we're we didn't push out laws, we push out what we call requests for comments or RFCs, and that is how internet has been governed since its very beginning. And very interestingly, uh, it works on the legitimacy theory, it's views on radical transparency, voluntary association, and location independence, so no matter where you are on the planet or on the planet, if you can connect to the internet and say, I'm interested in making a new internet program, you can just send an email and you're part of the lawmakers of the internet. And the internet itself doesn't report to any sovereign entity. It, it doesn't report, for example, to any of the nations. It doesn't report even to the UNITU, which for years tries to absorb us and we resisted that. And so the compromise was that we held an annual UN Internet Governance Forum every year. But now the internet still is kind of sovereign. We don't have a navy, we don't have an army, but we don't report to any other sovereign entities either. And so the way internet governs itself is called collaborative governance. We just keep asking two questions. We have a lot of people, a lot of stakeholders, we have a lot of stakes, different positions. But are there some common values? We call them rough consensus in internet governance. And given those common values, can anyone deliver innovations that deliver those values without leaving anyone behind? And we call them running code. So um, there's a RFC that says explicitly, we reject presidents, kings, and voting. We just embrace rough consensus and run the code. And that's what I learned when I was 15 years old. And that's how the digital ministry works in Taiwan, just by keep facilitating these conversations around common values and on delivering social innovations to the benefit of everyone. And so I can use some concrete examples, but I see that there's much more questions coming. So if you can roll in and feel free to raise your hand or just start speaking anytime. So how do I help Taiwan's laws and regulations keep up with new technologies? Um, how many people here are um, aware of this idea called forking? Fork. To fork something. Two people. Three. That's great. Yes. So a fork uh, is a software development jargon. It means you take something that's going to a direction, like a road. You keep something that's there, but you take it to another direction. And that's called a fork. Okay, so anything that is a um, government service, that is a website, that is something uh, that is not protected by the copyright, can be subjected to a fork. And um, I'll use one concrete example here. Just a second. Um, in Taiwan, we have this uh, movement called Go Zero, uh, and it's called the slogan is called to fork the government. And to do so is very simple. You can see, for example, the environmental ministry, EMB.gov.tw. 
you don't like it. You don't like how it's visualized, uh, its environmental numbers. Or, for example, the legislative, the LYGOVP, or, for example, the national budget. It doesn't matter. So all the government services in Taiwan is in a website that has in .gov, .tw. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's the same here and in other places. And so the people in the Gov Zero movement, whenever they're fed up with something, they just create a shadow website that is exactly the same URL, exactly the same address, but changing an O to a zero. So you don't have to Google for it, you don't have to search for it. All you have to do is to change an O to a zero, and you get into the shadow government. And so back in 2012, the first uh, project of the Gut Zero movement was budget g 0 vtw And when you go into that particular shadow government website, you see a visualization of the national budget. And anytime anyone can just click into the part of the budget that you care about and have a real time conversation about what you feel about the budget item, how, what's your suggestion about it, and things like that. And because of the Europe people, uh, we all relinquish our copyright when doing forks like this. On the next procurement cycle, if this popular idea um, gets support uh, from the civil service, they can just merge it back. So forth and merge it back in into the official website. So budget G zero BTW is now actually part of Taiwan National Service now. If you go to join that GOB that if you see all the thirteen hundred ministries projects and all the budgets, KPIs, spending, procurement, research, whatever, is all online. And anyone can just type in any question to ask the people involved and the civil service will just respond to you publicly. And so this uh, enables people to have a direct interaction with the public service, and the public service doesn't have to answer like 40 different phone calls and 50 different emails every day because they can just respond publicly. And so because this is a really interesting meme, right, it's in virus of mind, uh, so it spreads to other places. So just last week, uh, budget that G0V that IT, that's the equally Gov Zero movement, just get started. And so whenever we go to places, the Gov Zero movement, the fork and merge, uh, just emerge on that particular uh, position. Now the question asks about laws and regulations. So that too can be also crowdsourced and fork and merge. And this is a new system that we installed uh, that takes effect uh, starting January this year. It's called the Sandbox system. A sandbox system is that anytime anyone in Taiwan can go to this website and say, I want to make a social innovation that makes the society and economy better. But now I'm being blocked by this regulation or this law. And I think if you change this regulation or law in this way, the fork, things will work so much better. And then we actually do a kind of matchmaking to find a municipality or one of the First Nations or anyone that is willing to try with this new regulation and or law for a year and see, see how that works. And so you get to break the law for a year and see whether this is a good idea or not. And we also have responsible authorities, like if you're working on the platform economy, that's the National Development Council, if you want to do some AI banking, that's FinTech, the financial minister, or if you want to do self-driving tricycles that are flying, for example, the Ministry of Economy takes care of that particular sandbox application. And so this is actually the world's best, because in other parts of the world, uh, it's usually the Minister of Transportation taking care of those uh, self-driving vehicles. But in Taiwan, it's the Minister of the Economy. So for them, uh, drones and ships and cars are all the same, and you can have cars that fly or ships that go to the land or whatever, and you get to break the law for a year and see what happens. And if the society really likes it, if all the stakeholders agree that this is a good idea, then that new regulation and our law just become our new regulation. And people generally like the idea of fields that we want to experiment a little bit more. You can scale out and scale up the conversation to test for another year to two year max. But by the end of it, if there's a regulatory change or municipal rule change, it would just get merged back and then everybody learns something from that. Now if it fails, if uh, it causes some externality, if the society doesn't like it, um, well, we thank the investors for paying the tuitions for everyone. We all learn something. Uh, and it's open innovation, so the next innovator can build upon the data that is shared by the previous experimentation. Now, if this is a law change, the MPs may want more time to deliberate the exact wording 
of the law. So we allow up to four years for the MPs to do the full deliberation, around which time the experiment, including the business model, continues. So this is essentially a monopoly, a local monopoly, during the MPs deliberation. By the end of it, the law would have been changed. Your preferred version of the law would be made into the continental law system, the regional law system, and competitors will enter the market. Now the key question here is um, two questions. First, how do we know what the society, what the municipality, or the first First Nations mean? And the second is that at the end of the sandbox experimentation period, how do we know whether this is a good idea or not? So that are the two, two questions when introducing the sandbox governance model. For the first question, it's really, really simple. Um, in addition of uh, getting people to meet me every Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., I also tour around the country on Tuesdays. So for example, here is the uh, east part of Taiwan, it's called Huadian. And even more remote places, like the First Nations in Taidong, they can also video conference in. So I just regularly go to those remote, rural, indigenous places and see how things is like there. I maybe stay for a day or so. But as I have the conversation with their community leaders, with their elders, and so on, um, we always have a broadband connection back to Taipei, to Social Innovation Lab. Because in Taiwan, broadband access is a human right. Anywhere in Taiwan, if you don't have 10 megabits per second, it's my fault. And so because of that, we always have a reliable, at least 10 megabits per second, back to Taipei. And so all the 12 ministries related to Social Innovation are just in the social innovation lab. And remember, they enjoy this wonderful playful geometry. They enjoy this wonderful um, you know, food cuisine made by our resident chef. And so they're in a very relaxed, playful mood and see through my eyes how is it like to be in that particular municipality or rural or indigenous place. And so previously, when people here said, you know, uh, we wanted to the government to, to do something to relax the policy, to introduce a new policy, and so, so on. Sometimes the Minister of, of Economy would say, oh, we'll have to consult with the Minister of Interior, who would say, oh, we'll have to consult with the Ministry of Health and Welfare, and so on, and five months would have passed before anything uh, gets responded. But now, because all the ministries are in the same room anyway, so they cannot say that anymore. And because they see the actual habitat, the actual place where this social interaction takes place, they become very innovative. And this is coupled with the idea of radical transparency. Because, as I said, everything that I'm a chair of, I published the full record. So this enabled them to innovate. Previously, in the battle days, if they innovate in the public service, and it works out really well, the minister always gets all the credit. And if it doesn't work that well, the minister always blame the public service. <laughs> so it's a pretty bad deal for the public service. But now, with radical transparency, it's the other way around. If things work, the local people here actually see the face of the public servant who proposed this innovative approach of solving things. Everybody see on the transcript who, who proposed these innovations. And the journalists always can get a full interview <coughs> with the public service, which is no longer anonymous. But if it doesn't work out, well, first the risk is uh, kind of absorbed by the digital minister, because as far as I know, I'm the only minister in the world doing this kind of thing, so okay, we can always blame Audrey. And the second thing is that this is a public consultation, a public multi-stakeholder creation effort anyway, so nobody uh, can say they're being in treatment or things like that. It doesn't work because, you know, everybody can discuss that in a sandbox conversation. Now, the second question is that how do we know whether people like the idea or not, how do we form a consensus? Well, for that, we use AI-powered conversation. We use AI as a facility data. Um, so, for example, this very picture is uh, our first time deploying this system called POLIS, P-O-L-I-S. So in POLIS, very simply put, um, this case is when Uber first entered Taiwan using people um, for our drivers without professional driver's license and kind of evading tax and so on. And it caused a lot of controversy back at the time. People were really divisive if you, if you just look at uh, mainstream media. So we devised a way for everybody, passengers, drivers, unions, whatever, 
to go to this website, which is very simple. It shows you the avatar in blue, and relative to your Facebook friends and families and Twitter friends and so on, or if you don't sign in, then to some more famous people, and how you're feeling around the same facts is among the people that you know. So basically, we use the focus conversation method that's actually invented here in Canada um, that says, First, we crowdsource the facts. Everybody can contribute their experiences and evidences and things like that. And then we set aside a month for feelings. People just have to begin their statement with what or I feel that, I, I think that. So for the same fact, one, one can have a different feeling. I can feel angry, I can feel happy, and it's all okay. But then after a few months of uh, automated facilitation, that usually goes for one month, actually resonating feelings begin to surface and people start to get rough consensus. And at the end of it, we can hold ourselves to account by using only the ones that are reaching consensus as the agenda for this consultation that's always live streamed. And so for example, around autonomous vehicles, you may see one particular sentiment from one fellow citizen that you can click agree or disagree. And as you click agree or disagree, your avatar will move. Uh, for the mathematically inclined here, this is k-means clustering to find the clusters and principal component analysis to find the most divisive and the second most divisive sentiments. And so this has two effects. First, these are not nameless enemies or trolls, right? These are your friends and families and you just happen to feel differently, right? And that's all okay. And the second thing is that we don't have a reply button because we find that if we have a reply button, People just keep attacking each other's credibility or they post cat pictures or memes or whatever, right? But because we don't have a reply button, if you see after pressing a few agree or disagree, things that nobody else has risen, you can just, you know, post a new sentiment for other people to resonate or not with. And so basically we always end up with a shape like this. And this is very different compared to mainstream media or even mainstream social media. Um, if you just look at mainstream media, sometimes you just see those divisive statements as if that's the entire uh, social opinion or population because those drives clicks and that drives advertising and so on. But because this is a community-owned open source conversation platform that doesn't have a reply button, only agree or disagree, kind of has that overview effect and people just compete, not on getting more polarized views, but actually getting more resonating that everybody can actually agree with and live with. And so every time we get a shape like this, then we take the ones that was the most consensus as the agenda for a face-to-face -face consultation that's also live streamed over the internet. And so every time we can just get those consensus and go back to the innovators and say, here is what people feel about your quote-unquote disruptive innovation. And in the case of Uber, people feel very importantly that they have to have insurance, uh, professional driver's license, registration, and so on and so forth. So now Uber is legal in Taiwan, but they have to conform to all those crowdsourced rules that's based on people's shared sentiments. So it has to be social innovation. And so we run this kind of consultations for the past three years now, and we're getting pretty good at it, that you can raise a e-petition that has 5,000 signatures, and we guarantee that the minister or multiple ministers will give you a point-by-point point answer after 60 days of consultation period that is moderated, sometimes using AI, sometimes using um, you know, human dynamic facilitators, but most of the time it's both. So this is how we do um, regulatory creation with a need for social innovation. Um, there's five people who want to know how can it go back and tell us model to be brought globally during a time where democratic institutions are weakening, populism is rising, and animosity grows? First, I, I, I reject this view. Uh, I think it is only like that if you just watch mainstream media, which has um, a agenda of portraying the world in this way. But every time we run a consultation like I just showed you, uh, we find people actually have much more in common than they thought that they have in common. And so this is how a reflective space versus a partial uh, sensational space can do on people's perception uh, on, on their uh, own realities around overlapping realities. And so um, how to build partnerships? 
Well, first of all, um, we, we export the Dev0 model. I already talked about that. And second, we also use open innovation methodologies. And so this is a, a really interesting example I want to share with you. Um, let's look at this. Okay. So um, this is a map of Taiwan, of course, but also of the air quality of Taiwan. Um, in Taiwan, that's another of those Gov Zero projects. This is called the Gov Zero uh, Air Pollution Observation Network. And as customary with Gov Zero, right next to the name is a call to action that says, hey, set up your own measurement stations. Uh, and so these are really cheap. It's like uh, 100 Canadian dollars or less. Or it's really, really cheap. Uh, you, anyone can set up a, sense, uh, a air quality sensor uh, on the school, on your balcony, and, and anywhere. And so people just measure the air quality, but it's not just individually. This is also connected. So um, the researchers at Academia Sinica in Taiwan run this um, cloud thing that you can just uh, automatically upload those census numbers to. So you can, at a glance, very easily see the digital divide in Taiwan. Well, the air quality in Taiwan. Uh, and also, of course, how, how many people have volunteered. You know, this is very unique, especially around our region of the world. Uh, in East Asia, um, many, in many jurisdictions, uh, as the questioner has said, um, there's some animosity and the state, uh, more often than not, is afraid of the civic space uh, of people's ability to assemble, to express themselves, and to organize. And so in some places around our uh, part of the world, the civic space is shrinking. And so when I go to, for example, the UN uh, SDSN, the Sustainable uh, Development Network uh, meetings, or through a robot participating in other UN meetings, many other uh, ministers in East Asian countries tell me that they will be very afraid of this kind of thing happening. They will not wait until more than 2,000 people have gathered around in this kind of citizen science. Uh, and when it grows to 20 people, they will keep a very close watch on it. When it grows to 200 people, they will try to poach the leader into the government. And if they uh, refuse, maybe they get disappeared. This is not a joke. And so, um, so, but in Taiwan, we take a opposite stance. When we see, say citizen scientists, efforts like this, um, uh, you know, um, threatening the leg legitimacy of our environmental agency because obviously if you have two different numbers, one from the government, one from the networks that you participate, you're going to trust the network numbers, right? Even if it's less precise. So, so when we say we can't meet them, right? So we just join them. And so uh, the government does three things. First, we look at the places where the citizen scientists are not uh, that active and good complementary uh, uh, air uh, measurement points. Second, we manufacture higher precision, lower cost uh, sensor devices for people to hook onto those IoT um, networks. And third, we listen to those people who say they really want to have a air quality measurement device here, right in the middle of the Taiwan Strait, because uh, people really want to know whether the air pollution comes domestically or from abroad. But they cannot do it like that. Even drones run out of battery. 24 hours a day, but we can do it because we're running uh, with a national plan on renewable energy. So we'll have a lot of wind turbines that generates energy uh, in exactly that spot. So we can participate into the citizens' data gathering network. Now the international part comes in because all of this is open innovation. All the code is on GitHub, uh, and the hardware requires is very simple, like Arduino, Raspberry Pi. Anyone can procure that anywhere in the world. And so the end result is that without signing any state-to-state -state MOU or anything like that, citizen scientists around the world can just download the kit and start running. Uh, of course, you can also keep your own um, you know, network of uh, data analysis, but if you don't change the default URL, it all goes back to Taiwan. And so we have a, um, a um, network called CI Taiwan, uh, which is this. So CI stands both for civil IoT and collective intelligence. And so this is a collective intelligence network that we contribute to climate scientists, to all the people who want to understand meteorological data, water quality, earthquake prevention, disaster relief, and things like that, contribute that to the world. We have one website for each of those cross-ministerial actions. So CI, collective intelligence. We have AI Taiwan for augmented 
augmented or artificial intelligence with SI for social innovation and so on and so forth. So the, the answer to that question is that we just not just solve our local social environmental problems, but we also offer the way we solve it for free, open, on the GitHub or equivalent platforms for everybody to just use the fruit of the labor. And so I'll use another example. So this is the water um, quality water resource. And we have a lot of donations uh, from the Taiwan Water Corporation that shares uh, its data. It's called SCADA. It's a system that measures the pressure and the flow rate of the, the water pipes. And because of their sharing of the data, people who are specializing in machine learning now have uh, after three months of co-creation in the presidential hackathon uh, to measure a way to basically interact with the people who detect those leakage, they tour around Taiwan, listen to the water pipes, and discover new leakage on average one year or so before, uh, after a new leak happens. But now with machine learning, they reduce that uh, to one-tenth of the time. So that's a, a, a quick win. And because the innovation is open, people in Wellington discovered this web and said, you know, they didn't used to have a water shortage problem, and now because of climate change, they, they now start to have this problem as with other places around the world. And so their choice is either by this proprietary Israeli software solution, or they can co-create with Taiwan in an open way. And so they invited the social innovation team from the presidential hackathon, including the Taiwan Water Corporation and so on, to Wellington for three months right after our event, and they just provide their own water uh, measurement flow and pressure uh, numbers into our people, and then we just co-create new algorithms that help them to detect with water linkage. So this is what I mean by warm power. <laughs> uh, it, it's not just solving one or two sustainable economical challenges, but it's rather done in a way that enhances the availability of reliable data that enables the sectors to trust each other the people running the uh, citizen science airbox uh, numbers, they trust our government will not change the numbers. Why? Because they check into a distributed ledger before uploading to our network. So if you try to change the numbers, uh, people uh, in the blockchain world will know that we change their numbers. Of course we won't, but this uh, increased the accountability and the trust in the numbers, and then we offer those innovations in the open uh, to everybody. So through the civil sector to the social sector, and the social enterprises and social purpose organizations. We spread this kind of innovation to empower everybody around the world so that people can see that technology doesn't have to be uh, colonial, it doesn't have to be top down, it could just respond to social needs. And I think that's going to let people see um, the sectors are not at odds with each other and we can work uh, to strengthen and not weak, weaken the democratic institutions. Um, six people would like to know, when utilizing crowdsourcing tools in Web Zero, how do you maintain legitimacy? For example, filtering for serious answers and or preventing duplicate response. Well, the crowd does that, right? This is exactly how Slido works. Um, if you uh, see something that you don't think is a good question, the best bet is not reply, there's no reply button is just to propose a better question for other people to upload it. And, and it's as simple as that. In our national um, e-petition platform, we have exactly the same design. Uh, well, we actually took it from Iceland, from the Republic But in any case, yes, so we have a lot of e-petitions. And next to each e-petition, we have a pro and con column. That's anyone um, who may or may not be a citizen doesn't matter, um, can participate just by offering their commentary on this e-petition. And so there's a pro column, and there's other thoughts, like con column. And each column, you can really reply to each other. If you don't agree with the sentiment posted on one column, your best bet is to put something on the other column and for other people to upload it. So the crowd regulates itself, and we just harvest the, the top uh, entries on both columns when doing a uh, consultation on that particular petition. And so I hope that answered the question because it's um, always the collective intelligence can be harnessed if you design a space so that everybody just adds something to it without taking anything away. 
if you design space so that people cancel each other out. Uh, like, for example, if we had adopted a visual design here, the initial draft had a visual design that would proportionally show a green bar as longer and the red bar as shorter because there's 200 people contributing on one column and 16 on the other column. Had we done this, it would be a zero-sum game and people will game the system to make their faction look larger. But we don't do that, so people don't game that particular system. There's a lot of subtleties in, involved. And for example, in the polis system that I just showed you, uh, when in like this system, it doesn't matter how many people are in each k-means cluster. If you mobilize 5,000 people who vote exactly the same way, it may be bots or something, uh, exactly the same way, it's just a dot here. It doesn't increase the area because we measure for diversity. We measure for the uh, difference, the range of uh, opinions. But the numbers, we never look at the numbers. Uh, so it's not a count. It is not, strictly speaking, a vote. We're just looking at the resonance of the people's feelings. And so in that kind of um, social design and interaction design development, the crowd can just keep adding on each other's collective wisdom without taking anything away. So many people would like to know, how can today's youth best equip themselves to engage in the information age and the democracy of the future? This is an excellent question. Um, so before joining the cabinet, uh, I served on the K-12, the basic education curriculum board. And so our work will be rolled out uh, next September. Uh, in Taiwan for all the first graders in primary, in junior high, and in senior high. And in redesigning the curriculum, which is the largest redesign ever, and this first redesign that includes the parents and teachers into the co-design process, uh, we basically shifted from a skill-based curriculum, as is very customary in East Asia, uh, to a what we call character-based curriculum. The difference is that previously, um, in the basic education system, set up different tracks, different disciplines, different majors, <coughs> different departments, whatever that means. As a junior high, I don't know. But in any case, uh, when I dropped out of junior high, um, I know that if I haven't dropped out, I'll be forced to choose one or two majors when I enter senior high. And people will be competitive on particular tracks. Uh, there's a fixed number of tracks and plots that you have to score higher or work harder or whatever, that's very, that kind of bias. But in our new curriculum, we emphasize a different set of characters. We emphasize autonomy, like looking at a new emerging social environmental issue and just let curiosity take you over and you learn whatever that's needed to learn. We emphasize uh, communication and interaction, meaning that you can think critically, but you can also work with people with different disciplines, cultures, and fields. And third, it's about common good, so that you may encounter people who don't feel the same way as you do, but you don't use each other's as means or tools or instruments, but try to find the common grounds on which to build the common good and the common values. So autonomy, interaction, and the common good are just the new values, and that's what our new examination system, our new curriculum design system, our new capstone projects, our university social responsibility, programs, our SDG-based curriculum, all these are redesigned to fit into this. And the reason why that we emphasize those very internal, intrinsic factors is that the old skill-based education system we think is not the best one when machine learning takes over so many automated tasks. If people over-identify with particular skills when they are, for example, seven years old and they start over-identify with one particular skill, they say, you know, I excel at that, uh, compare uh, with, with other people, and it's very narrow. And maybe five years into the future, AI comes and ultimately that way, and uh, does it better than any human beings, then that student will suffer a loss of dignity, and we don't want that to happen. But on, if, on the other hand, people identify with the autonomy, interaction, and common good, which are all human being qualities, then any automated tools are just going to be reinforcing your social mission and your environmental mission and purpose. And so this shift from skills to characters is, is a world view change. And I, I realize I may be preaching to the choir here, <laughs> but, but I, I think this kind of cross-disciplinary and purpose-led thinking is really one of the most important things 
as a either young people or as a lifelong learner, and we have re-architected the entire basic education and also um, graduate, undergrad and graduate level education system in Taiwan for this very purpose because we want people to identify in their education system with the social environmental missions, not with the particular track, and especially not about competitiveness among individuals. I think that's a broken model. Some people would like to know, how do we guard against corporations exerting undue influence in guiding internet conversation through vote manipulation, media control, etc. This is a great question. And so um, I'm going to share with you a interesting thing that I always uh, recommend people to install. Um, you don't have to install it, but I think it illustrates the point uh, pretty well. Um, it's called Newsfeed Eradicator. As it does what it says on the tin. Um, if you uh, install it to Safari or Chrome or Firefox, any popular browser, I think there's a mobile version as well. Um, it eradicates the news. Right? <laughs> and you replace it with a random quote that's inspiring. This one's from Adler. Uh, but in any case, uh, that's it. So um, the Facebook actually has two parts, right? One part works like a browser where it's intentional. You have to search for something, type a hashtag, click your friend's profile, click into mm -hmm. messengers and send something, um, share a blog post, and start a live stream, whatever. So you, you start with an intention, you see what you intended to see. In that sense, it's like a browser. But on the other hand, there is the speed part, which is like television, right? It, it just pushes things uh, to you and with a way to kind of um, optimize for uh, the attention span that you spend on particular news feeds because they want to keep you on Facebook for as long as possible. And so as you press like, it figures out what kind of things will outrage you or will make you happy or make you uh, feel addicted and start this dopamine cycle of uh, undue uh, influence that just learns uh, in a way that's also called domestication except you're the domesticated one. But in any case, <laughs> it learns your habits and, and how it feeds and so just by disabling this part that fits into the dopamine cycle, I can get you to use Facebook exactly the way as I use a browser. I can still use it to communicate, but I close the part of the loop that generates a, a tobacco or alcohol-like um, cycle in my brain. And so it cannot actually manipulate my feelings around particular things. Now, th I'm not singling out Facebook, right? Everything, other media is like that. And so, um, I think at the end, uh, it is purely psychological. Um, if, uh, for example, in the basic curriculum starting next year, we teach media literacy and critical thinking skills by having the teacher co-learn with the student instead of the teacher holding the standard answer to authority over anything. And so this is like you know, um, learning how to swim in overwhelming information and not to let any particular wave uh, take one over. And this is important because if in the previous era, in the previous century, people in Taiwan learned that there's a standard answer from an authoritarian teacher and things like that, um, the companies, they piggyback on that sort of message and format their message in that kind of way. And it just kind of latches on the mind and go viral and influence uh, people's polarized views and things like that. It becomes very easy to manipulate people's feelings if you believe in authority, but if on the other hand people learn to collaborate in a horizontal power kind of way, then everybody gets a different perspective, people understand it being inclusive, drives the innovation and things like that, it becomes much harder for anyone with a lot of money to exert undue influence on popular opinion simply because people learn to critically think and to swim in a um, waves of um, information and misinformation and things like that. And then we learn that we are ourselves all media. Uh, we're all self-media, and we can still communicate as well. Eight people would like to know if you have any thoughts on the concept and the usability of a global cryptocurrency. Um, so um, in Taiwan, we use a lot of TLT, uh, distributed ledger technology. Or um, I, I always use the term TLT uh, rather than blockchain. Uh, because um, 
I use also the term internet search instead of Google uh, because <laughs> these are technologies and these are the effect of technology, the actual social value that it delivers, right? So distributed ledger is, of course, new, emerging, very cool technology. It doesn't have to be blockchain. It can be other distributed database technology that enables people to have an immutable ledger uh, on which to write things. And so in Taiwan's government, we use a lot of DLTs. Uh, I already mentioned that the air quality measurement use DLT to keep everybody honest uh, before checking in to the National Super High Computing Center uh, for the um, meteorological measurement devices. We also use it, for example, to track accountability for cross-source donations across borders. So for example, when Nepal suffered a flood, uh, there was a crowdsourcing, uh, sorry, crowdfunding uh, effort by the UNUS Center, and people uh, tracked the money flow by voluntarily contributing the, the flow of donations and how it trickled over the borders of the NGOs on the Ethereum um, distributed ledger. And that then enabled everybody to recreate uh, the money and donation and charity flow without overly dependent on any particular organization in any particular jurisdiction. We're now also evaluating distributed ledger technology for use, for example, for migrant workers who sign a contract on one country, but maybe arriving in, in Taiwan, having their contract being swapped or things like that. And we can use DOT to track the exact wording of the contract by compiling a uh, algorithm-based contract into uh, text-based normativity that's called contract law in, in each country and keep that uh, on the record. And you will note that I all, uh, all the example I, I said use the DOTs as an accountability layer and trust layer instead of a cryptocurrency layer, right? So while we're tracking the contracts, the air quality numbers, um, the donations and so on, these are still ordinary currencies. These are not cryptocurrencies, mostly because I think at the moment there's um, the transaction rate, um, the, the rate that it scales, the power consumption, energy consumption, and so on. It still requires a lot of new mathematical insights uh, to really solve it as a real currency. Uh, at the moment, um, we have a swarm-like behavior that we kind of saw during the uh, dot-com boom days, which is great. <laughs> but we, we, we don't have one single um, answer, like whether, I, I don't know what's trending now, hash graph perhaps, or, or yield count, or whatever. Uh, is going to be the, the next uh, cryptocurrency that solves all those uh, different trade-offs. So no, we, we don't have a global cryptocurrency yet, but uh, if someone maybe here figures out mathematically how to solve that, uh, I for one welcome. And also, uh, I would invite you to file your experiment in the Taiwan FinTech Sandbox, because the FinTech Sandbox is explicitly set up to allow for things that the digital minister doesn't think it's ready, but the innovator knows it's ready, and so you get one year to break the law to show the society that you're ready, and if the society likes your idea, your idea becomes the law, and that is why we need regulatory co-creation. But at this very moment, I don't really see one single global cryptocurrency taking over, and maybe that will be another few years. Um, some of people would like to know talent development and retention are among the most pressing issues in Canada. How does Taiwan facilitate a strong, sustainable talent pool ready for the future? This is a great question. Um, yeah, we um, always, for the past, I don't know, decade or so, um, the, there's a very um, catchy term called Ren Tai Wai Liu, literally uh, talent flowing out. Um, and that is a, like, any politician in Taiwan would say, oh, it's among our top priority to, to stop the brain drain or whatever, right? Uh, but um, in Taiwan, I, we actually don't worry that much about uh, so-called brain drain or so-called uh, flying out because we because we believe that in what we call it in Taipei, uh, a recirculation of talents. Uh, just in the past year, the past, I think, 12 months, since we passed the Foreign Talent Act that enabled the so-called gold card uh, talents to basically come to Taiwan, be a digital nomad, still work for yourself or any, any other company, 
just enjoy the food and the problem as human right and the excellent food and things like that. And then and, and, and you, you can just stay for, for three years for no particular reason and that's uh, renewable actually, unlike Singapore. Uh, and so we actually can get a lot of digital nomads just visiting Taiwan just for fun or they like hiking or they like surfing or whatever. And then what we have discovered is that Previously, we, we have a previous generation of especially software developers uh, like uh, Ethan Du, for example, who uh, used to work in Microsoft, uh, director of Cortana, of Switch Technology. He works on Cortana at the same time I work on Siri. And so he just went back to Taiwan uh, a year and a half ago and bringing not just himself, but also his team back to Taiwan. And so this is like fishing books or whatever, as long as we create a, a better uh, social and regulatory environment that enables the creative type C that their new innovations makes an impact on society and gets recognized as such, and that our regulations, our laws evolve with time quickly enough for their emerging technology to make a difference. They actually get attracted because of the impact, not because of salary or anything. Of course, we still offer competitive salary, but the most important thing is the social impact, which is why we're now seen as a kind of AI center around our region in the world by having, I think, all the multinationals have set up AI research labs uh, and centers in Taiwan now, and have a very solid uh, exchange program as well. Now, for younger people, like people in basic education, we've also discovered if, as part of their learning, they spend two or three years just working on their local social environmental problems, and make an impact on it. They may go study abroad, but when they study abroad, they always try to think to apply their knowledge learned abroad to the social environment problem that they care about as a child. If on the other hand, uh, during the basic education system, we isolate them from the surrounding environment or community, then they don't get this kind of motivation and they, when they go abroad, they don't want to come back, and which is why we developed the university social responsibility program, our new curriculum, and so on, by having people earn credits, and just by being a social entrepreneur, basically, during basic education and also during the college years. So this is how we nurture our talent, and we're happy to share them with the world, but on the other hand, they also come back, and with even more people, their research teams, um, their, uh, the, the team that they care to maximize the impact on the society. Um, um, so people would like to know, is there a way to prevent the, the PRC from systematically exploiting the openness of deep petitions to influence Taiwan's democracy and sovereignty? Um, it's kind of simple, <laughs> actually. Uh, very easy. Uh, if you want to profess a deep petition, we ask your email address and we ask your mobile phone number, and that's it. So we send an SMS and an email confirmation we have to verify. It's very hard, actually, to get 5,000 Taiwanese SMS numbers without getting out of this. But on the other hand, we don't ask for your real name. So if you are in a place where you suffer from social injustice, or that you want to reveal something, or who's working in public service, uh, and you can still post under a pseudonym, just as you can here in Slido, but we verify plus that you have a domestic uh, SMS number, or if you're a uh, someone with a residence certificate, you can participate as well, but it's tied to your ARC number, which, by the way, uh, we're adopting a format of uh, ARC, Alien Resident uh, Certificate, that is compatible with our national ID system, so that we're now seeing um, foreign people who want to stay in Taiwan, to contribute to Taiwan, to basically, uh, even if you cannot vote uh, yet, you can, and that will be like five years of residence, you can still do e-petition, you can still do participatory budgeting, you can still do a lot of democracy, provided that you um, care about Taiwan and are willing to be involved in our democratic institutions. So that's the very simple way that we just make it very difficult for people to get 5,000 uh, SMS numbers uh, in one year, so that's the e-petition system. Um, and people would like to know, Many internet platforms have very skewed user demographics. This POLIS is likely to be used in seniors. How do you ensure that though all opinions are represented? This is a great question. It is true. Um, on the e-participation platform, joint GOVTW, of the 23 million people in Taiwan, there's about 5 million active users, which is pretty good, one quarter of the population. But we do see that it's mostly 
young people and retired people, mostly because the, these people have a lot of time on their hands. <laughs> <laughs> but but for the rest of the, the people, why can we say, you know, uh, this is still legitimate? That is because a few things. First, um, when we do consultations like this, we always show um, in the kind of beginning of each of our consultation slides um, a pretty picture uh, that is two diamonds. Um, how many people here know this double diamond thing? So I don't have to explain not many to that. Okay, uh, I have to explain. This is called design thinking. This is a really interesting way to look at things. Um, it separates any problem uh, into four phases. Discover the first divergence, define the first convergence, and then develop the second divergence, and finally deliver the last convergence. And so the, at the middle of it is a how might we question. This is a common value that everybody sees after checking in with each other's facts and feelings that is seen as a common problem that we need to solve as a polity or as a uh, group, or as a um, family, or whatever, it doesn't really matter. And so um, using design thinking methodologies, we always say the heat petition is really just the first part. It is just to discover what problems are there for people that feel that there are problems. And our consultations, including POLIS, is just at the first convergence to let people uh, define the common how my we questions to identify a common social good or social value. But actually, when it um, influences or it impacts the general population, we always go to people instead of asking people, go to the e-petition system or go to the e-participation system, because then that would not be fair. And so I use a very concrete example. Uh, for example, um, this is a petition from Last May, um, and I'm sorry that we don't have an um, English translation. Uh, so the translation is, I think, the tax filing experience is explosively taxing, right? So, um, right, a very taxing tax filing system. Uh, and we, we get this petition. And last May, uh, it is from this random person on the internet who says the tax filing experience is just awfully bad. Uh, but all the uh, members uh, by the financial minister uh, receives says that overwhelmingly these are Windows users and they feel that it's pretty okay. And so it turns out that it's only on Mac and Linux and iPad and Android that the experience is broken because they use a wonderful technology for Java applet that has been deprecated. Uh, and so uh, people would just wait on a screen that says, uh, please wait while we install necessary extensions and we just linger on there forever. Uh, and so, yeah, it really, people really feel angry about it. And so, because we have a team of participation officers or POs tasked with inviting anyone who is angry with their minister into a co-creation workshops, that's literally the only thing they do. And, and so, instead of just explaining the problem as media officers or as uh, parliamentary officers, are what to do, the participation officers sends out invitations to the hundreds of people protesting on the internet uh, for the resign, re resignation of the Ministry of Finance or something like that. Um, it was a, a large uh, amount of negative energy. Uh, but they just very simply, after a day and a half, posted an invitation saying, anyone who complains now gets an invitation to join us in our co-creation workshop two weeks later in Taipei in the, minister, in the Ministry of Finance. And so the second diamond is always in a place bringing power to the people closer to the king. If this is a domestic issue, if it's a municipal issue, if this is an issue in the rural lands, we bring all the ministries to that place for the second diamond. We always have a town hall that we let anyone just walk in and the digital ministry, that's me, uh, serve as kind of an ESPN anchor to uh, explain to people in the town hall what the consultation uh, process is 
what are of those experts who is a lot of positiveness trying to do, and so on and so forth. And people can just, in their language, uh, tell me in any modality, it would be Slido, they can whisper to me, they can write, uh, they, can, they can sing, they speak a language, they can be using uh, songs. We still haven't had performative dances yet, but in any case, people can contribute with any modality, and we just turn them back into the context of this shared user journey. And so this is uh, one of the standard designs and methodologies we use when doing the uh, develop and deliver part. We identify what the people on the internet have identified uh, before the text filing, during the text filing, after the text filing. We identify their actions, what their needs, and how they feel. And the very important thing is that, again, the mobilization, the numbers doesn't uh, make a difference. If you have 5,000 people uh, posting exactly the same thing, it only counts as one posted note on this map here. So, and it's also important that we don't harmonize people's opinion. That is to say, if they say uh, the words are explosively numerous, uh, we just post that. If they say, you know, it's so glamorous, I don't know what to do, we just post that. Uh, if people say, uh, don't bother making us feel better during the text filing process, because text filing is inherently uh, not a good feeling, just make it as short as possible. Uh, we, we post that as well. And so we include people's feelings uh, and contributions in a way that's maximally inclusive. We actually go to places and talk to people in an ethnographic way, and then bring those results into co-creation workshop that involve the people who complain the loudest because they care the most. And so these are the people who are in the bottom right in this picture. And after four co-creation workshops, we co-delivered a service that looked like this, and now looks like this, and now has 96% uh, approval ranking. But even the other 4% understand that their ideas will be taken into account in the next year's technology experience. And we do this uh, as a uh, general government digital service principle now. So we're bringing this to our healthcare uh, delivery system. We're bringing it to our company registration system, our social care system, and the rest of the system by basically making people who complain the loudest into co-chefs that talks to people who are closest to the pain. And so this is how we get the legitimacy, not because we just let random people put it on the internet to determine the direction, but just by having them surfacing the problems, but they still go to the people face to face, but also in a live stream way, so people can contribute from afar uh, into this co-creation workshop. So POTUS is just the beginning, but these co-creation workshops are the latter half of the design. AP posts that when I first started learning Perl, um, is actually P-E-R-L, there's an extra A here, but in any case, at age 12, uh, a language which is highly criticized as being, quote, a blind noise, unquote, what was your drive and why Perl? Um, so back uh, when I started my first startup, uh, that was around 1995, there's no other language to program dynamic websites. There's only Perl. There, there was no Python or Ruby or PHP. Uh, PHP actually stood for uh, Perl, a personal page or something like that. Uh, so all these were derivatives or, or offsprings uh, of the Perl language. So when I started, there was only Perl. And so um, now, of course, uh, I, a after having worked on the next generation of Perl, which is uh, used to be called Perl 6, but it's now also called Raku, um, Perl has really evolved quite a lot. Um, and this is kind of interesting because just as we, um, in the sustainable development goals, we also say, you know, previously people believed that there's three sectors or three concerns or three different angles in the world. You can work on the economy, or you can work on the environment, or you can work on social solidarity, but it's very hard to work on the three simultaneously. The SDGs are here to remind people that if you work on any of the 169 goals in the 17 categories, you automatically reinforce work of people on the other goals as well. That's the spirit of the SDG. So the same thing as with Perl, and I'll work on Perl 6, now called Raku, uh, because in many programming languages, there's one dominating paradigm. For example, if you program in, in Haskell, right, uh, 
something that's called functional. You, you think of the world as a um, mathematical function. Uh, or if you program in object-oriented languages, then you think of the world as objects that has interactions. Or if you work on simpler, what we call imperative languages, you'll think of the computer as a very dumb thing, and that you just give it a command and things like that. And Perl was designed to be, what we say, reconciling the irreconcilable. So I work on Perl 6 and for Raku, is that whatever paradigm you choose, we're a humble designer. We allow you to express yourself in whatever paradigm of the programming language uh, that you choose to express. But then we work on a ontology, which is a fancy term uh, of saying how to sort things, uh, and to let you express in one particular worldview, but still make people with different worldview to make sense of your contributions to the language vocabulary. And so uh, the design of Perl kind of informed my thought process of reconciling the different sectors of public, private, and social, or the different concerns, environmental, society, and economy, and think of ways that are just reinforcing the partnerships among those looking different, but actually working on a common body. Thanks, so uh, I think Pearl has changed my brain, I think, for the better. Um, if you would like to know, as openings decrease, fund investment in tech development, regardless of whether it's offset by crowdsourcing, an open contribution. This is great, great question. So um, for people who are economists or uh, interested in, in common here, uh, because I don't have a lot of time to, to go into the economy of this, but uh, there is the book uh, by my friend, um, also economist, Ruth Pollock, uh, called The Open Revolution. And he explained the economy of what would happen if we fund, say, pharmaceutical research or any kind of important research, not in a current patent-based licensing based system, buying a more, I don't know whether people here use um, I, um, Apple Music or um, you know, Spotify, the, the kind of model where it's paid by, um, by use, by how much impact it actually has on the society through a remuneration model. And so this is a interesting uh, line of research, and I understand also Canada is uh, exploring with those two different, uh, the old proprietary vertical and the more re remuneration based open funding models these two coexist, they also coexist in Taiwan, they also coexist in software development, it's a very old debate. And so for quite some time, I think we'll see them coexisting but at least in the uh, field of software engineering, uh, the, open pro uh, the open world has clearly won. We know it when uh, Microsoft, uh, our arc enemy, uh, actually uh, joined the Open Innovation Network and donating all of its patents related to Linux and other open systems uh, into the patent pool so that it can be used for free by anyone who agrees to also not sue other members uh, for patent infringement. And this is a classic a uh, full open kind of revolution way of software development. And so Microsoft really did a huge turn and, and they are now also GitHub, which is, I mean, for, for uh, us both guards, it's very difficult to reconcile, but I think they have really changed its ways. Now whether now Red Hat will make IBM also change its ways remains to be seen, but there's signs that I think are very positive, at least in the software development world, that people are generally moving into um, the open innovation model, where people basically invest into open innovation, not out of altruism, but because people see the world as being so complex now, um, if the industry doesn't share the burden of maintaining existing technology to an emerging, fast-changing world, then everybody ends up not uh, actually better off. And so what used to be called an asset or intellectual property is actually a burden if you don't share the maintenance with the open ecosystem. And so that's true for software development. It's true for people who participate in open access for some fields. For some other fields, it's not quite there yet. So we're within the open revolution and we're slowly but surely getting there. Some people would like to know how can Canada and Taiwan to middle powers collaborate more in the area of open data and digital governance through both official and unofficial channels. Um, well, I, I was just in over 50 uh, as a uh, conference in Ottawa, 
and um, I talk with pretty much everybody <laughs> in the in the official service here, and I'm very happy that you now also have the additional minister, uh, and I also talk to the additional minister staff, and I will be back next May, actually uh, back to Ottawa for the Open Government Partnership Summit, the OGP Summit. So uh, the official part is working really well. Uh, and we also brought along an official part as well. Uh, in um, Toronto, we held a two-day workshop teaching the methodology of e Taiwan, of POLIS, of the art of Gov Zero with uh, Code for Canada, which is roughly the equivalent of Gov Zero here, and also Civic Tech Toronto, and also people at Mars, uh, and uh, I mean the, the Mars, not Mars, but, uh, <laughs> but also uh, the, the local government in Toronto City, and also Ontario, uh, government. And so I, I saw something really interesting, which is just like the early Gov Zero hackathons six years ago, we run a workshop with the state level, provincial level, federal level, government people, Gov Tech people, and the civic tech people, and the CSOs. People just sit very closely next to their kids, like people who are at the same level or the same functionality unit. Uh, and so our first instruction during the two-day workshop is to maximize the number of strangers. If you see anyone at your table that you happen to know that person, please move to another table <laughs> so that people can actually mix and mingle. And so it worked really well. We chose a common topic uh, here to both Taiwanese uh, and Canadian people that is um, ride sharing. So Uber lived in taxi. Now after being legalized, uh, how do we actually share the data to ensure accessibility and also to reduce congestion and carbon footprint and things like that. And so yeah, people really co-created really well using the civil society uh, methodologies as well. So we're, I think, on the right track uh, to collaborate on uh, digital governance. And we have also a lot of just very simple technical tools uh, to share. So at the moment, the Canadian uh, digital service is considering uh, a system that we, um, well, I personally uh, contributed and are now deployed across all the levels of the Taiwanese uh, digital service is called Sandstorm. Now Sandstorm is a cybersecurity product masquerading as a productivity suite. Uh, so basically it enables, um, I, I assume here people have heard of Slack, and so this is Slack equivalent, it's called Rocket Chat, uh, Dropbox equivalent, uh, a equivalent to Trello, uh, which is called Weekend, and also document editing, which is like Google Doc, and I personally maintain spreadsheet part, and uh, it enables anyone in our public service to write any application whatsoever and deploy it in a way that's conforming to cybersecurity standards that uh, single sign on and that enables the app to be shared across levels of public service. And because of radical transparency, I'm just going to show you exactly how we use uh, Sensor uh, in the Taiwanese uh, administration. Because of radical transparency, anything I can see, I can publish. But I cannot access state secrets. So if they run a military drill, I just take a day off. I still don't know where the bunkers are. But that, <laughs> that means that uh, every day I just wake up and open the sandstorm system and see what my staff is up to. Now my staff, also very interesting, because as you can see, 22 people here, I can poach one person from each ministry office. So with 34 ministries, I can coach at most 34 people. At the moment, it's 22 people. So it's a very horizontal way across silo. Each person is still being paid by their own ministry. They allocate for the value of that ministry, but we all do this practice of working out loud. Working out loud means that we are not afraid of letting all other ministries, or indeed people in Canada, see what we are up to, right? Are waiting, doing, and done. We just did a translation of the comic book uh, <laughs> that we used to explain the open government process. Uh, we actually did it in indigenous language as well to honor our first nation. Uh, the Amis uh, people, um, our official spokesperson of the administration is actually now indigenous. Um, so, and to honor all the other Taiwanese languages as well. And so because of this habit of working out loud, um, people really learned to contribute any simple way, any small and quick wins that ultimate part of the chores of the public service. And so one of the most popular applications that we have in this cybersecurity hardened 
white hat hacker certified system is actually a way to order lunch boxes together. And so people just write uh, these simple JavaScript systems um, and that I'm sure that you can see um, if you know some Chinese characters of all the nearby restaurants uh, near the administration building. Uh, we scan all the menus of the nearby restaurants and it actually remembers my preferred um, <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, it's single sign-on, it knows my name uh, and um, yeah, and if you want to add some eggs or order some soup or whatever you can easily uh, let you order things together and this is one of the most popular applications written by public service members and shared with other members in the public service as well and so people just use it to plan trips together or whatever and so this is, again, open source, entirely open source. And so the Canadian government, as we speak, is evaluating this technology and see whether it can be brought into the digital service of Canada. Um, eight people would like to know, in the sandbox, to what extent can the law be broken? And how is innovation control regulated during the one year period? Very good question. Um, yeah, so um, we have a small disclaimer, like, uh, although, in the fintech sandbox, for example, it's not restricted to the sandbox um, laws of one particular, um, one particular ministry. So, for example, in the sandbox, in the um, fintech, you can also challenge laws by the central bank, for example. And if during the anchor vehicles, which is economy, you can also challenge rules and regulations by the ministers of transportation and interior and whatever. But there are two things that one cannot uh, challenge, aside from the Constitution, which goes with that thing. Uh, you cannot say, I want to experiment in money laundering. That's a no-no. We don't know how that experiment will end. And then you cannot uh, fund terrorism. And that is also, no -no. we know that how that will end. But aside from money laundering and funding terrorists and breaking the Constitution, everything is fair game. And so this is a very strong continental law, I think the strongest continental law, sandbox system, where you get to challenge any ministries, any regulation whatsoever, uh, if you can somehow tie it into a social environment of good and, uh, and uh, impact. Of course, it has to make sense. If you, you, you get something really random, everybody would just, because it's open innovation, right? This is posted to the public internet where everybody can see. So people who, who love their, their face, so to speak, will not propose something that is very ridiculous. But so more often than not, we, we really get, get really nice innovation proposals. Like our first application, the FinTech, I still remember that's a, from a telecom. And the telecom says, I want to offer loans to people who are 18 years old or so, who did not have a credit history. So the banks cannot figure out how much interest rate to charge you if you uh, decide to apply for a loan. But a telco actually knows your credit history because you pay your telephone bill every month. And so, and also, when you get your SIM card, you already give them the photo ID. So they claim that they have this algorithm that is better than the bank's KYC system. Uh, and so you can just open a, a account uh, without actually going to a bank. You can just use it by your mobile phone, and they know that it's you through you know, the SIM card and uh, the habit of you using their telecom service. Now, the experiment is uh, rolled out to 4,000 people, and the uh, multi stakeholder panel agreed uh, that if within one year uh, there's five cases uh, of misidentification of people actually using their cousin's um, telephone numbers or whatever, uh, impersonation or, or money laundering or whatever, uh, as long as there's the fifth case, um, the entire experiment will terminate and people will know that this algorithm is not yet ready for the prime time to replace the uh, so-called uh, risk control uh, system of the traditional banking system. But however, if after one year, uh, everybody says, oh, it actually does financial inclusion, it enables more people to this. Um, to, to do banking in a way that uh, enabled them to have better access to financing or microfinancing, then uh, it gets scaled out and it becomes our new regulation. And so 
yeah, you can challenge anything, but there's reasonable bounds. And if it fails, it fails spectacularly, that is to say, in an open way, so that any other innovator uh, that tries it for the second time will not repeat the same mistake. Um, six people would like to know, seven people would like to know, did you face any difficulties into transitioning to a government position where things often move slower than I envisioned coming in? Uh, well, actually, no. I am happily surprised by how fast and how innovative uh, the public service is once you have a minister that is willing to absorb all the risk and share all the credit. <laughs> right? That, that's, that's the recipe of innovation. Um, the entire setup goal of previous of our office is based on the very simple idea of voluntary association. And we have, have our common values as well, right? We always start with common values. And our common value in the middle is to build mutual trust uh, by having the government trust in the citizen first. And maybe some of the citizens will trust back. This is our core value. And to the left, we want to nurture social innovation so that when the government admits through radical transparency that we're helpless to solve a structural problem, at least until the next budget year, the social innovators will step in and show the government how to do it better, at least for that year, during using symbols and other social innovation methodologies. And during which we automate a lot of the chores using machine learning and so on, so that public service don't have to focus on the parts that are repeated, that doesn't require human judgment, communication. These automatable parts, those chores, are automated by having an innovation shared across all the levels of the public service. And finally, uh, we threw away like the presidential social innovation hackathon, have the public service members propose anonymously through the help of the civil society members, new and interesting ways to improve the public sector service. So the way it works is that every year, the president announced that for the next three months, I'm going to crowdsource new way to make public service better based on the presidential promise that Dr. Tsai proposed when she ran for president. Some parts we went really well, some parts not so much. And so anyone is welcome to suggest new ways for public service to work uh, in a way that delivers better on the presidential promise. So for example, this year, we got, in the beginning of the three months period, 105 suggestions of how to make public service work better, many of them data related. Uh, so maybe they have an algorithm, they want data, maybe they have data, they want machine learning experts, so on and so forth. But the interesting thing is that even though they're from so-called civil society organizations, we know just by the way that the, it's written, more than 70% of these cases were prepared by public service, by members of public service that are mid-level management or so, uh, that didn't have the budget, didn't have the political will, that has cross silo communication barriers and so on. So they just write a proposal, tell their CSO friends to propose it to the president's office, and say, oh, we're very happy to help. But actually, they wrote it themselves. And so the end result is that after the three months of co-creation, if it really works, there, there's 20 cases every year that the president's office selects. And personally, the president's office is the PM for those 20 ideas. And so there's no data, there's no bureaucracy that you cannot navigate when the president herself is your project manager. And at the end of it, we select five winning cases that really produce a tangible benefit. And there's no prize money. There is no monetary reward. The reward is that for the next budget year, the president guarantees that your idea become public service. And so through simple tricks like this, we just make sure that public service is able to innovate in a way that has the risk absorbed and has the credit shared. And that is how the digital service, um, the real value of this. Now, I'm being reminded that I only have two more minutes. And so I'm, I'm going to, first, I'm sorry for all the um, questions that left unanswered. Uh, I'm happy to, um, you can follow me on Twitter, for example, and we can <laughs> carry on the conversation in, in Twitter. Um, and I would all just uh, want to share you uh, my job description when I first became the digital minister two years ago. I was in New Zealand at the time and talking to Maori people. 
who was really inspired by the Austronesian tradition, they started, the culture started from Taiwan, you know, 4,000 years ago, and it went all the way to the Maori people. Uh, and so I wrote my job description and as a poet. Uh, and so this is uh, literally my, my mandate. Uh, it's after one month of co-creation that I turned this poem into the work that I'm sharing with you now after two years. And so the poem goes like this. When we see internet of things, let's make it a internet of beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that the singularity is in, let us always keep in mind and always remember that the plurality is here. Thank you very much. on behalf of everybody in this room here that that was an extremely, you know, that was an extremely, extremely inspiring uh, presentation. I feel like in, in, in undergrad, I know we have the constitution, there's some policy and comp side, but I feel like a lot of what we've learned, it's, you know, kind of up in the air, especially when we talk about data, especially when we talk about digi digitizing for the future, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I love that all your work has gone to try to offer, to, to operationalize that and making real impact engaging more and more people, engaging youth, engaging uh, programmers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to really work together and collaborate and to make all those things we hear about in lecture and talk about and, you know, that governments talk about and actually making it real. Um, so often I feel like that's not so much the case and, and I think your work is a true inspiration to all of us in learning how we can take what we learn in class and really, really make a difference in so thank you very much for taking this time to, to speak with us. Thank you for the great questions. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. I think there's some food left outside. Please feel free to help yourselves.